it was soaring across the field when it actually we were dumbfound, I think, and uh, uh, it was so low you could see the oval shape of the uh, of the object with a red light in front and a red light to the rear of it. It appeared to be cigar shaped, maybe the size of an, uh, an automobile. Uh, from red light to red light, there appeared to be illuminated white lights the, the whole length of it. I thought I was going to look in the window and see something extraordinary because we were that close. Uh, I really didn't see anything inside. There was no movement, no uh, objects, whatever. So uh, it just soared and hovered. You know, just uh, just actually unbelievable. It almost seems like a dream, really, that uh, what we did see. It seemed like a dream. Yeah. Uh, it soared over this direction, across here, and over this tree line. And later that night, I think it was within a half an hour or less, uh, there were several sightings in Mansfield of uh, similar type descriptions. Just after midnight on April 19, 1966, four police officers and a family of three witnessed one of the most extraordinary events ever to take place in the town of Sharon, Massachusetts. All four Sharon policemen were more than willing to tell us a story which has been echoed thousands of times by many reputable persons throughout the world since 1947, when Washington pilot Kenneth Arnold coined the term flying saucer after a close-range aerial sighting, the first highly publicized case of this century. Raymond Fowler of Wenham, Massachusetts, has been investigating UFO phenomena for many years. I saw a daylight disc myself back in 1947 uh, in uh, July, when I was uh, working on a farm as a as a teenager uh, in uh, 1947, and the interesting thing is that the next day that the local newspapers had uh, a big story in the front page stating that flying discs, as they were called then, were seen in that particular area that very day that I saw this particular object uh, go over. Uh, with a falling leaf motion. My first thought was that it was a parachute and uh, because it was was going sort of like this and I thought boy it must be someone bailing out. I didn't see any plane or anything and I looked for shroud lines under it and no shroud lines, no person and it kept on descending like this into the distance uh, falling very very gently uh, like a falling leaf. The uh, flying saucer came from that direction came across, stayed out there a while, and it came back, it hove it over here, and it took off in that direction. And it, to my estimation, it looked like a, you know, a football. It had flashing lights, all the lights going around in a circle around the area of it. And then, uh, side, you know, it looked like a football to me with a whole mess of flashing lights. These were white windows that appeared to be mullions. This was all white lights. This is what the chief and I were trying to look in to see if we could see anything. But that give you, I'm not a good artist, but that mm -hmm. rough idea. There were cars moving up and down the street. As it passed from that tree line in a westerly direction, it blocked out several of the cars, and as it moved, the cars appeared again underneath it, which proved to me that we were looking at a solid object. It either was round or, as it appeared to me then, football shape, and it was no higher and no further away than those fir trees from us as we walked towards it. None of you had seen any uh, aliens, is that right? No. 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 And uh, what is your own personal theory, we'll go down the line here, what your personal theory is about this, what it actually was, where it might have been from, do you have any idea, have you harbored any theories over the years of what it might have been? Well. To myself, I would say, uh, I saw it, I left here, I spoke with the uh, Air Force, was it the Air Force yeah. that came down? And after that, I just put it right out of my mind. You kind of blocked it out? I or? blocked it right out. You didn't want to think about it, or you just forgot about I it because it was just another incident? I didn't want to have any more to do with it, to be honest with you. I figured uh, what I saw, I told them what I saw, and that was enough for me. I, uh, it was a, an experience in itself, and I didn't want to go any further with it. How about yourself, Chief? Any personal theories? Well, it was something unique, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it could have been something that the, the country has that uh, doesn't care to discuss or reveal. And, uh, or it could have been something uh, from another planet. Either one. Uh, it had to be one or the other, I would say. I might add that uh, it was during this particular period of time that uh, several sightings 
were made of similar objects. The one that uh, I recall uh, vividly was the one in New Hampshire, and a great deal of credence was plussed, placed in that sighting, as was this. You know, we have uh, four, I think, responsible people here who saw something. Sh shortly after the sighting, I think it was a couple of weeks, Look Magazine did a uh, profile on, on a happening in New Hampshire where uh, a uh, uh, married couple was uh, supposedly taken onto their ship and, and uh, given physicals on board uh, the object, whatever it was they seen. And uh, I was working a 4 to 12 fill-in shift. It was maybe 10 o'clock at night at the uh, police station. Uh, I was really into the article. And uh, I think at that time, uh, was, my concentration was so much on the article, the door opened at the police station. and. Uh, I, uh, I think I felt like I hit my head on the uh, ceiling, my feet, I don't, never touched the floor, so it just startled me, so it was just kind of a strange uh, experience. Did you, did you feel as if uh, you know, anything like that might have happened uh, that you're unaware of, that you were Well, no, it, it just seems strange that we never made more of it, that, uh, like I say, if you see a, a, a bus smash up or something, you'd... Uh, You'd say, "Holy smoke! What's happening? And why? Why?" And then probably talk a lot about it. This thing here just seemed to go away by itself, and uh, I've often wondered why we didn't discuss it a lot more or, or, or think a lot more of it. I understand that you did some uh, a radio interview with WNEW in New York, just following this. Yes, correct. Uh, who participated in that? Uh, I did. When it moved in front of us, it took shape, and there was a uh, red light in front, a red light to the rear of the object. There was what appeared to be a long strip of glass that appeared to be a window, and you could see the curvature of the glass indicating... This man saw a UFO. He is not a saucer nut. Not one of those people who claimed to have sought this little green man or to have flown to Venus in an exotic spaceship. He is instead a policeman, a normally calm and skeptical type who saw something that shook him up. It may shake you up a bit, too. <laughs> Sunday news close up. Tonight, the Sharon Saucer. The Air Force adopted a standard posture to meet inquiries from the public and from the media. All flying saucer reports that could be ascribed to natural causes were given prominence. While truly puzzling cases, what we would call today high strangeness cases, were kept away from the public and the press. When the press on its own insisted on statements, and that hot explanation was contrived, under no circumstances was any statement to be made which could add fuel to the public's curiosity and concern. How can we correlate this information? How do we know what we're being told? We probably don't, right? We only, uh, they only reveal what they want to reveal. And again, you know, it's a, it had to be one of the, the other is what all I'm saying. It had to be something that we had that was, uh, they didn't care to reveal what it was or uh, uh, something from outer space. The government didn't cut us in on any information. The Air Force didn't communicate with us as, as to what they did or didn't find. NICAP came out and, and made the investigation, took the radiation readings in the field. So they did make an intensive investigation of the scene, remained in the area for maybe three days. Matter of fact, Mr. Paolo wrote a book and included this in his book. Uh, I think I mistakenly said before that the, uh, the Air Force took the radiation readings. They didn't, it was NICAP really that uh, oh, I see. the reading. We understand from the uh, officers on duty that they are unaware of the Air Force uh, coming in and saying anything to them. Is that uh, your understanding also that the... The, the officers office may, may have been unaware, but the police chief wasn't unaware because uh, uh, Captain Zelensky at Otis Air Force Base informed Hanscom Field to uh, perform the investigation because they were closer and they dispatched intelligence officers to the uh, police station. They did not interview the officers as far as I am aware of. They just interviewed the police chief and told him to keep the blotter confidential and to keep a separate blotter uh, from henceforth uh, and let them know about the sightings. Did you notice any um, electromagnetic effects, any radiation uh, effects after in the area? 
What, what we did that night was notify through uh, Officer Jones's urgings, uh, he notified uh, Otis Air Force Base on in, in, uh, the Cape, who the following day uh, brought here, or flew over here, a, a radar plane that circled this particular area for, uh, for uh, uh, quite a period of time. Uh, my understanding was that they did uh, find uh, radiation uh, readings in the field that were uh, above normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did flyovers to do that? We had a radar a plane flying over the uh, area here for most of uh, the following morning. The uh, government authorities came in and uh, said that uh, further incidents on this, uh, this t of this nature would have to be included in a separate police blotter? Uh, I'm unaware of that. The chief at that time suggested that we keep a, a separate blotter for all incoming calls on UFO calls because we did receive uh, uh, many curious calls and also people saying they had seen sightings or whatever. But it wasn't due to the government uh, saying that? I'm unaware of it. It could have happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, did the government say anything in terms of, you know, don't, don't publicize this? Again, I'm unaware of that. I wasn't the chief at the time and uh, perhaps it was uh, said to the, my predecessor, uh, it wasn't said to me. Mm -hmm. Are either of you aware of that? Uh, I would know on that the chief was correct on that. On April 22nd, the United States Air Force investigated the case and talked to the uh, police chief at that time and told him not to release the blotter and to keep all such reports on separate blotters and keep them confidential. One of my investigators, Ernest Reed, was a private detective and threatened to go to the attorney general if he didn't release the police blotter because it was within the public domain. The police chief said that he had rather face the Air Force than the Attorney General and uh, released a copy of the blotter. And of course, that's part of the, the case. Ernest also took radiation readings of the field uh, over which the object hovered, and the uh, radiation was many, many, many times above the background radiation for that particular area. Someone on Walla Walla Park Street also saw it uh, that night. Can you tell me about that? Do you remember that? Uh, there were several other sightings that night uh, by people in, in, in Sharon that had seen it, uh, I guess, at a greater distance than we had seen it here. But they had seen it, uh, uh, wasn't it the previous night or something? Someone was at the... Uh, yeah, yeah, night. Yeah. Yeah. Also on Walla Walla Park Street, there were other sightings over the years. Do you recall any? Yeah, there's so many things that went on after that, and we heard and read so much, uh, I'm not clear on, on who seen what, other than there were several other people that did say they had sightings in Sharon at various times, is that right? Yeah, Raymond Fowler actually saw something in Beverly. And earlier that evening, I was out investigating another report, which turned out to be a media, and I saw something very strange that night. Of course, I didn't realize at the time that this was going on. So I think perhaps I saw the same object that they had seen maybe over Gordon College. There was a total of three objects seen, one in the distance at Beverly, uh, two in the distance rather, and one at close. Could you describe what you saw? Uh, what I saw essentially was a, an oval object that was completely illuminated. It had no, no, no navigation or lights on it. And I managed to get ahead of the object and get out in the field with my flashlight and it was going over, I heard sort of a droning, humming sound, and I began flashing my light at it to see what would happen. Nothing happened, and it kept on going. When it got to the horizon, it sort of just went like that, behind the tree line, and that was it. Uh, little did I know that uh, maybe uh, 15 to 20 minutes earlier, the Beverly sighting was going on, maybe about two miles from where I was, and I didn't know anything about it until the next day when I was called by the civilians who had seen the sighting. And we should probably repeat that uh, a couple days earlier. It happened in Sharon at, at midnight that they had seen, the officers had seen that object also. Same type of object. And uh, on April 17, uh, in Ohio, uh, we had another uh, sighting, a uh, close encounter of the second kind because there were physical effects, uh, which involved a, a glowing object which paralyzed two officers who were watching it. It was witnessed by several other officers who joined in the chase and it was at a very low level as well. The Air Force explained that one away as a Venus uh, and or a satellite. The object hovered over this bridge was seen by both the Pennsylvania police and the Ohio police. It emitted a bright flash and then went up and out of sight at very, very, very terrific speed. And again, the Air Force uh, explained it as uh, the planet Venus and or a satellite. Are you familiar with the straight line theory? Have you ever heard of that? 
Yes, uh, Amy Michel, a uh, French uh, scientist uh, who investigated uh, sightings, especially uh, in the uh, 1957 period in France, uh, indicated that his studies showed that uh, UFOs would travel in straight lines uh, across territory and that they, they would join up at places uh, sometimes where a large cigar shaped object, a long cylindrical shaped object was seen and in some cases the object would be seen to be uh, releasing smaller objects or taking uh, smaller objects on. Speakers at the forum that we have here within the next two days are the spiritual heirs of the legacy of Dr. Heinex. From local and national investigations developing new ideas from the data, to pioneering new paths of research, to engaging in scientific debate with debunkers and critics. And I'm sure that Heineck would be pleased to know that the UFO phenomenon is having its frontiers and barriers pushed back further and further than ever before. Is there something that you feel would best exemplify the status of the UFO incident today, or is uh, the same type of thing still happening as happened 20 years ago? The UFO phenomenon is not affected by societal events. There have been changes in the phenomenon in terms of the reports that we have received since 1947, and that the, a larger number of reports these days are closer to the ground. However, in general, by and large, the type of sighting reported today is exactly the same as it was in 1947 and all the way through. We are dealing with a phenomenon that is persistent and consistent here. It makes no difference who reports it, who sees it, what their educational level is, where they live, what the technological level of society is, what stress the society is undergoing, nothing. It is unrelated to societal events. The important fact I think that we should know about UFOs is that the phenomenon has a life of its own. It does not change with the sophistication of the society, for instance. The only thing that is different about it is the way in which, which UFO researchers have focused on it and what they have chosen to concentrate on. Mm -hmm. And right now, UFO researchers are concentrating on material that is on or near the ground, or close encounter cases, as they are so called. And uh, I feel that this is probably one of the most important developments that have happened in uh, recent years. I helped found the UFO Study Club in Syracuse, New York, uh, way back in 1965, and um, was an active member and promoted that kind of uh, thing and investigated it. As a matter of fact, we had uh, rather interesting um, events uh, during that time, so Northeast Blackout particularly. Oh, yeah. And uh, for those that are in the know, the Northeast Blackout was organized by our extraterrestrial friends for our benefit, uh, centered in western Massachusetts, but um, that has yet to be acknowledged by many. I've certainly seen uh, uh, craft over Syracuse. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a very fine uh, testimony in one instance where um, uh, we watched uh, several us uh, from the UFO study group, as a matter of fact, that evening, and it was still in the sky, so I said, uh, I'll go up, I'll take a chance. I called Hancock Air Force Base. Hancock Air Force Base is no longer in existence now, but is outside Syracuse, which uh, the reason for the Air Force Base was because it was protecting the northeast quadrant mm -hmm. of uh, the uh, whole, um, uh, scan, uh, I forget the name of it, anyway, it's the whole radar system. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I... Uh, simply dialed the number and I said um, radar control please and they connected me and the whoever answered said um, radar control Jones speaking and I said do you have an uh, uh, unidentified object in the east northeast right now yes we do sir there are other civilizations that we don't know of and they're much older than ours and they're studying us in other words oh they've known about us for many years I've had a uh, another interesting thing in Syracuse I had a um, extraterrestrial sent, uh, sit in my office you're kidding no no, he, um, he came in and uh, we had a conversation and uh, the reason I know about this is because um, it was interesting that he controlled my thinking. Uh, he sat there in the chair 
Uh, number one, the fact that he knew a uh, complete and utter stranger I'd never seen before. He knew exactly where to come to. He knew what questions to ask about the Northeast blackout and what our UFO study group was doing about it. And uh, he uh, had a very uh, unusual type of dress. He looked as though he stopped down at the, uh, at the um, uh, uh, Salvation Army and gotten a pair of socks, shoes, and whatever else. But um, he asked certain questions. And then as I watched him go down the hall after he left, uh, why, um, he just disappeared. I visually saw him just out of sight. What did he look like? Like a, anybody else, yourself or that gentleman, or uh, yes, oh, very much so. Nothing different. What's no, no, dark no. skin. Sometimes I've heard reports no. that uh, the men in black supposedly. Uh, well, that that would be uh, possibly true. And it was very interesting. Uh, I I I got in gear after he left, obviously, because he had a mentality which was able to occlude uh, a lot of the questions. Unfortunately, which I thought of about 220 uh, after he left, and. Um, uh, I didn't really get a chance to ask them. He uh, somehow mesmerized my mind or occluded it in some way. And um, I sure wanted to find out what we knew about this whole situation. Did you ever mention that, that to parishioners? Or? Well, at the time, I, uh, I've been a chaplain in the um, VA hospital for 30 years. And um, so I was not directly involved in the crisis. Yes, I've mentioned this to many uh, people. But um, I don't necessarily integrate them with the whole matter of uh, pro proclaiming the Catholic guys, faith. And I like to think of ufology as a family, and that each of us is uh, carrying out a part of the work, uh, each contributing in our own way uh, from what we have to contribute. And we have to persevere, we have to continue. I think of the Northeast here uh, in, in the image that comes to mind of, of liberty and freedom and, and individualism, that uh, I was always brought up to think of the Yankee as, as being a very individualistic in the person. And I think that's precisely what we need in this field. We need people who are not afraid to be different, to be individuals, and to propose new creative hypotheses and uh, get on with the work, regardless of the consequences. UFOs are not a new phenomena. It's been, or they have been in existence ever since uh, the new, the Old Testament, the scriptures, uh, during the book of Ezekiel, and uh, during the days of Christ on earth, uh, and later on through the centuries that follow. So it's, it's a controversial part of ufology because there are different opinions regarding whether the UFOs were in existence at that time. Mm -hmm but it's very well documented in many different books by many different authors over the many years that have In other transpired. words, uh, the, for example, the chariots of Ezekiel, as you mentioned, right, Ezekiel. Right, the, the wheel, yes, that's right. And, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, Jesus was carried up when he uh, supposedly uh, uh, was resurrected from the tomb, and uh, when they found that he was missing, the fact that uh, angels had been seen in the area, which are actually uh, aliens, friendly aliens, which took Jesus back to one of the alien planets for which we believe he originally came from. You asked about the religious matter uh, earlier. We've got to recognize that these um, civilizations know far more than we here on Earth about um, definite and very pervasive and uh, final spiritual laws. Now, one of which is, because you don't like it, you don't destroy it. And this is the Earth man's attitude. Uh, if I don't know what it is, I'm going to shoot it. Shoot first, ask questions later. That's the Earth man's attitude. But the, diff, uh, the recognition comes from those who are benevolent and knowledgeable that you just don't go around destroying and so forth. If this were true, uh, let's face it, uh, any uh, visitors could take us over between breakfast and lunch and have time for coffee. But we really needed some type of solid information. I felt of all the places to go to obtain that information, 
What does the U.S. government have? We've heard stories about government investigations, Air Force jet chases, sometimes uh, jet disappearances, so on. And with the advent of the Freedom of Information Act, we felt we had an opportunity to finally look into the government files. Well, I think the most interesting thing I've run across is the fact that uh, despite government denials, the UFO phenomenon clearly shows a threat to national security. We've seen it many times in, in some of the release material, especially in recent reports. We had, in fact, a wave of incidents in 1975 involving a, at least a dozen different Air Force bases, nuclear facilities, missile silos, and so on, where the objects flew so close to very sensitive areas that uh, a national alert was declared. And it frightened the hell out of the Air Force at the time, but the public knew very little about it. Mm -hmm. Your theory as to the reason that the, it's being kept quiet is actually what? Well, I believe that the government is doing research into how these things fly, what they're made of, and uh, various other engineering technical aspects that uh, the last thing you want to do is make your research known to everybody so that you can carry on mm -hmm. quietly. In your opinion, what was the best documented case on record? Well, uh, one of the cases we dealt with in our book uh, involved uh, an apparent landing at a NATO base in England in 1980 at the joint RAF Bentwaters Woodbridge facility. And that seems to have involved a landed object, a uh, possible alien being seen by numerous Air Force personnel, security people, high-ranking yeah. officers. Wow. And not only do we have eyewitness testimony, but uh, we have an audio tape made at the time describing the incidents and aerial sightings, plus uh, a document which the Air Force released uh, by the deputy base commander detailing his involvement in the sighting. And uh, it backs up much of what was said by the witnesses that we interviewed uh, initially for the book. That's fascinating. What did they say the beings looked like? Well, uh, they were the typical alien beings, I guess you could say. Uh, the description basically was uh, somewhere in the area of three to four feet in height, very much similar to uh, what's been reported in, uh, in many of the more popular UFO abduction reports. Uh, I think if you imagine the, the creature in Close Encounters of the Third Kind near the end of the movie, that may be uh, close enough to what was seen. We have conflicting reports about that, by the way. Uh, some people saw them, some people didn't. We are still trying to gather information. It's very difficult right now because many of the people are still in the service mm -hmm. and they really don't want to talk about it until they get out. Dave Gray. This is Steve Dave Gray. This is the same Dave Gray that did it before. No, I remember it. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Get away from me. Get away from me. I don't want you to do that to me. Leave me alone. Get away from me. I don't want you to do that to me. My mom will be mad at you. Anyway, it goes on to talk about a needle being put up the nostril and caused a lot of pain and a number of other things. And then he goes into the house and he tells his mother what happened. And his mother says, you had a bad dream. And he says, no, I saw them, these awful people. And she said, you had a bad dream. And finally persuades him he had a bad dream. You got bugs. Buddy, let me just ask you one you question, bugs. though. Yeah, can we really answer. see it? We yeah, saw it, right? We saw it. Right? <laughs> okay. As long as we saw it, that was the main thing. I think uh, as, both of these both of these guys retired now. I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jimmy will agree with me. We kid each other a lot, but it's criticism on the side. We all discussed it among ourselves, and as the chief said, I read every article I could find on it. It was seen by chiefs. Deputy Sheriff, Sheriffs, their vehicles have been disabled, but it's pretty hard to discuss it with the public because you're open for heavy criticism. My theory is, and this is just a theory of course, 
that since people are regularly reporting what they describe, we are dealing with something that is anomalous, something that is unique, something that uh, refuses to change. The only way that one can think about this is to at least posit, at least suggest, the extraterrestrial hypotheses.